greetings. I'm glad to be with you again in our study of uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, I hope uh, that you're finding it to, to be beneficial and uh, practical, uh, hopefully insightful. Uh, it has uh, been so intriguing to me to see how the book of Revelation is laid out by John. Uh, the book uh, consists of seven different sections, and as we've noted in the first uh, five sections, each of those sections introduces to uh, seven specific and important uh, symbols or pictures. Uh, we have seen in the first five sections uh, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven significant signs, seven bowls of wrath, and each one of these sections have taken us from the first coming of Jesus until the day of judgment in some respect. Each of them look at it from a little bit different angle, which gives us a broader perspective about the things we can expect to see in our world, uh, why we need to remain faithful, and each time we come to the point of God's victory uh, over uh, all of his enemies. So as we move into this sixth uh, section of Revelation, we are kind of anticipating another uh, vision that includes seven things. Uh, what we find, though, is that the John uh, is given a different vision this time that doesn't include the seven specific items uh, for our consideration. However, this section, like the previous five, is going to survey all that uh, is going to happen throughout the entire church age, uh, regardless of whether you're a Christian living in the third century or the eighth century or the 21st century. Uh, the things we're going to see in our world are described in these chapters leading up uh, to the coming of Jesus Christ and his uh, final victory uh, over all of his enemies. Uh, so the question comes, uh, why does John kind of shift gears here and not give us a, a series of uh, seven new images? Uh, well, I really believe uh, that the Lord was uh, wanting John at this point to uh, kind of deal with maybe what we would call today the elephant in the room for that first century audience. And it's not that he hasn't spoken to that in uh, the previous sections, because he has. But there's going to be a more focused look in these chapters at the specific situation uh, that uh, the seven churches in Macedonia were facing, uh, living in a time where they were uh, constantly under the threat of persecution. It may not come, but on any given day, uh, any one of them uh, might uh, lose their job, might have property confiscated, might be beaten or thrown in jail, even have their life taken away simply because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. And uh, the uh, elephant in the room, so to speak, in uh, their time was obviously Rome and the Roman Empire. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, this part of Revelation is going to take a more focused look at their situation, but it's a situation that every generation of Christians throughout history have, have also faced. As uh, we uh, try to deal with the pressure imposed upon us uh, by the powers of our world. And that's what John is uh, looking at here. Now, in terms of that first century audience, uh, you know, they were uh, living in the Roman Empire, even though they lived over in Macedonia. Uh, everything coming out of Rome was designed to control them. Uh, they lived under Roman law. Uh, they lived in uh, Roman military occupation. They lived in a culture where they might be called on to compromise their faith and acknowledge Caesar as Lord. You know, something that Christians shouldn't do, but uh, that might be the pressure that's uh, applied to them. Uh, and any of the philosophies and ideas and, and influential trends that shape how people think uh, were coming out of Rome and, again, designed 
to get Christians to comply uh, with their worldly standards. And I don't care who you are, if you're a Christian, we do uh, deal with temptation. And when you're under a lot of uh, pressure from outside forces, one of the great temptations would be to maybe compromise your faith. After all, if you're a first century Christian, you're living in Rome, you feel the might of the Roman Empire, it's hard not to see that as the most concrete and real thing in your world. It is more concrete than this abstract kind of faith. Now, we know that's not true, but that's what you're tempted uh, to uh, buy into. And you're tempted to uh, simply make compromises uh, to your faith. Um, so that's the big issue that John is dealing with in this particular section. You know, if you lived in Rome and under the Roman Empire, it would be easy to feel. Uh, you, you maybe know better, but you feel like there's a certain invincibility about Rome and about uh, the Roman Empire. And therefore, uh, you know, it's just not um, in your best interest not to conform uh, to the expectations of a, of a pagan uh, or anti-Christian government and the controlling city that influences uh, everything. So that's the issue that Paul is dealing with. Now, you know, through the centuries, we deal with these same kind of things. As governments change, as cities collapse or lose their influence, other governments rise and other cities emerge. And so what John is trying to share with those first century Christians and really Christians of all ages is how, how to look at anti-Christian government that imposes its pressure upon us. And how do we look at the cities of the world that have such influence and which also apply so much pressure on us to compromise our faith? How do we need to see that so that we can remain faithful and we can be steadfast and committed to Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost that we encounter here in this life? Now, with that backdrop, we are going to move into chapter 17 through 19 and take a look at uh, this section of Scripture. So I'm going to uh, share uh, my uh, screen with you right now, and uh, hopefully we uh, are going to uh, 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 be able to see very clearly how John uh, expects us uh, or how Jesus through John, or, uh, yeah, Jesus through John is expecting us uh, to look to look at our world. So, Revelation for the rest of us, so chapter seventeen through nineteen. What we're going to be exposed to today is really a study in contrast. Uh, we're introduced to the beast, and we've run into the beast before, but this time we're going to see the beast and his prostitute. That obviously sounds wicked and uh, deplorable, but we're also going to see the Lord and his bride and the ultimate victory that comes uh, uh, in Christ. Now, uh, we are going to uh, read, uh, or uh, excuse me, uh, we are now going to read through these sections. Uh, I am assuming that you've had an opportunity to read these chapters, and if not, you might want to pause the video each time we move to a new section of these verses so that you can uh, take a look at it. But we're going to begin with chapter 17, and uh, in chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, uh, John is shown uh, the punishment of the great prostitute who seduced kings and the inhabitants of the earth. Well, uh, what, what is John portraying there? Well, uh, throughout this section, I'm going to provide a little glossary that helps define certain things. The great prostitute in this vision is the community of man in opposition to God. In John's day, it was Rome. Uh, throughout the centuries, the name may change, but the principle is going to be the same for Christians, regardless of what age they live in. In Revelation 17, 3 through 6, 
uh, John saw an alluring woman riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. She held a cup of filth in her hand, and her name was Mystery Babylon. She was drunk with the blood of the saints. So we get an interesting picture of this prostitute. Uh, the beast here, as we have seen earlier in Revelation, is simply a, a symbol for anti-Christian world government uh, that uh, tries to uh, force uh, or apply its pressure on Christians to compromise their faith. Babylon uh, symbolizes uh, ancient Rome and all the prominent uh, cities in history that uh, obviously do not exist to promote the cause of Christ. Rather, they stand opposed uh, to Christian principle. Now, the blood of the saints is a strong image of persecution. It says that uh, the woman, uh, Rome, <laughs> and any city like Rome, was drunk with the blood of the saints. And Jesus is simply being honest with the Christian community. Throughout history, there are going to be those Christians living under certain regimes and the power of their capital cities uh, that are going to face uh, persecution. And uh, that, that is a reality of uh, our world. In Revelation 17, 6 through 8, uh, John tells us that the beast emerges in one place, that is anti-Christian government, is destroyed and then pops up in a new form. It comes from the abyss and ultimately goes to destruction. And non-Christians are astonished. Well, the world government, uh, anti-Christian government, uh, John depicts here as being empowered satanically. Uh, and uh, those whose uh, names are not written in the book of life refers to non-Christians. The non-Christians in, in this passage, they're amazed and fascinated uh, uh, by world government, and uh, we'll have uh, more to say about that in, in just a moment. In the chapter 17, verses 9 through 11, uh, John says that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, he, he introduces us to seven heads and seven hills, and seven kings. Uh, uh, we read about an eighth king, which emerges, and he too will go to destruction. Now, the seven hills refer to the city of Rome. That's the city in question. Uh, but the number seven obviously uh, extends far beyond Rome. It's, uh, it is the, the symbol of something that is complete, and so uh, John is describing what happens in any of the major cities of the world throughout history. Uh, seven kings refers to all coming uh, Roman rulers. And then the eighth uh, ruler will mark the end of the Roman Empire. John uh, then goes on to describe the ten horns uh, as uh, ten future kings. They receive authority for one hour. These make war against the Lamb and his people, and the Lamb and his people always emerge victorious. Uh, the 10 here uh, represents the totality of all future world governments. Uh, he's not talking about 10 literal kings in sequence. He's talking about the totality of future world government. Uh, they receive authority for one power. That simply means that uh, uh, their, uh, their opportunity to rule is, uh, is only for a limited time. That's true of all kings and all governments. And the governments of the world can never achieve lasting power, and uh, they can never conquer the people of God, although they, they try to. They try to squash out the existence of the church and try to squash the Christian hope, and they can't get it done. And uh, so they never achieve lasting power over the Christian community. In Revelation 17, 15 through 18, the woman, 
The great prostitute is the great city that rules the kings of the earth. The beast and kings eventually turn on the woman. God causes this irony, demonstrating his continuing rule. Well, the great cities, uh, beginning with Rome and uh, cities ever since, who have ruled the world eventually are toppled uh, by other kings and other governments. That's just how history works. And the cities of man, uh, you know, still the cities of man try to exalt themselves. You know, uh, uh, it would be so easy if you were living uh, uh, in the Roman Empire to think that Rome was invisible. That's how the cities, uh, prominent cities of the world present themselves. But they are not. And God, in the end, manifests his sovereignty over the city, because the amazing thing is that the governments that uh, initially support the city, eventually another government comes to destroy the city and see its collapse. And if it doesn't happen in the historical process, it is certainly going to happen uh, in the final judgment of God. Now, in Revelation 18, 1 through 24, this entire chapter depicts the tragedy and despair of the great city when it collapses. And the eyes of faith see the city as fallen. This is a fairly lengthy chapter, uh, but we want to read it as a whole in order to, to get the big picture. Uh, remember that John is writing to Christians who are having to deal with Rome. It seems like Rome is invincible. Uh, many times in our own world, depending on the country that you live in, it seems like that the anti-Christian world that you're dealing with and the prominent cities that are calling the shots, they are, they are invincible. And maybe uh, we should uh, finally concede that and not stand up for Christ because of what, what it may mean to us. But what John is telling us in ver verse 18 as Christians we should be able to see more clearly. We should be able to see that the real truth is there, there is no lasting value uh, to the uh, uh, pressure and the temptations that come from the city. We must not give in to it. So let's read this chapter uh, as a whole. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Rome has no lasting power. The major cities of the world that influence our time have no lasting power. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth had committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. That happened uh, in Rome. It happens today. The major cities of the world uh, are a, a place where uh, other dignitaries and other powers and other populations come uh, to uh, seek and find pleasure. Uh, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury that she gave herself. In her heart she boasts. I said, enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. In other words, I am invincible, and you must succumb to my pressure. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine, she will be consumed by fire. Uh, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. 
terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of uh, citron wood and articles of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of the fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand uh, far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out. Woe, woe to you, great city dressed in fine linen, purple and garment and glittering from gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has brought you to ruin. Every sea captain and all of the travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads with weeping and mourning, cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed upon you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bride, uh, bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, all of who have been slaughtered on earth. Whoa. <laughs> what an amazing picture is painted in Revelation 18. And John's total focus here is to help those first century Christians understand that the city that seems invincible is not. It will collapse. And any city of, uh, that presumes to uh, rule its people or rule the world and apply the pressures for Christians to compromise, it too will collapse. There's nothing lasting about the city. And if it doesn't collapse, even in the historical process, it will definitely collapse under the judgment of God. And so this chapter is revealing to us principles the work throughout uh, the entire church age leading up to the very judgment of God when uh, he uh, destroys uh, the influence and, uh, and power of uh, the major cities of the world. Now, note that anytime the cities of man fall, it leaves those who have put their trust in them devastated. Uh, you know, that's the thing that John is getting at here. We understand that the communities of man are not where we find our lasting pleasure, not where we find our eternal hope. So no matter what it costs us, we need to stand up against the, the kind of cultural pressure that we receive uh, to abandon our faith. We, John is uh, uh, teaching us, we're going to see it differently. Our governments are not invincible. Uh, the uh, cities 
of influence and power are not invincible. Uh, they have, uh, we're not going to get any lasting pleasure there, and we're not going to find any eternal hope there. That is a, an amazing picture that John has uh, painted for us. Now, when we come to Revelation 19, 1 through 10, <laughs> we find that upon the city's fall, heaven breaks out into a hallelujah chorus at God's victory for the saints. You know, when history has run its course, and we've seen these principles played out throughout history, there's going to come that final moment uh, when uh, the, the final city of influence uh, collapses under the weight of God's judgment, and the wedding of the Lamb to his bride is announced, and she is given fine linen to wear. Let's read that uh, section. In Revelation 19, verse 1, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of, great, of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, and they said, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like the peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah. For our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Once again, the Apostle John has uh, led us right up uh, to the uh, uh, final day, the victory of Christ, and we're going to see shortly the condemnation of uh, Christ's enemies. Now, the bride in this passage, uh, the bride of the Lamb, is obviously the church. It consists of uh, his people who have remained faithful despite the world's temptations to compromise our faith. The fine linen they given to the church represents the righteous acts of God's people. God's people are those who live righteously and who don't compromise their faith. Now, on the day that God's victory comes to, uh, um, uh, to his people, <laughs> judgment also comes to his enemies. Let's read this final portion of chapter 19. In verse 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose uh, rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down uh, the, uh, the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, 
gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fire, a fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of his mouth, uh, out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on his flesh. In this picture in Revelation 19, John once again has uh, brought us right up to the judgment of God. He has done that in all of the previous sections of Revelation, and now he does it again. And uh, the picture is clear. Jesus is the rider on a white horse. His name is faithful and true. You can count on him, and he's always going to tell it like it is. He is introduced in awesome power and glory as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, leading God's spiritual armies. He destroys the beast of world government, including its kings and supporters who have defied God. He destroys the false prophet. Uh, that is false religion and false uh, uh, philosophy. And the beast and the false prophet are destroyed in the fiery lake, and others are destroyed by the word of God. This is clearly a picture of the final judgment of God and a reminder to those first century Christians and to us where we need to put our hope. We put our hope in Jesus Christ. We will not compromise our convictions, our standards, our values for the sake of governments and influential cities that have no lasting power and that will collapse under the judgment of God. So uh, you might be saying at this point, uh, English, please, you know, can we kind of wrap this up in simple terms? <laughs> Well, the cities of the world tempt Christians to walk away from Christ. It was true when Rome was in control. It's true of the major cities of our world today. Uh, uh, they make sin easily available. <laughs> and, you know, and their influence is not just within the city. You know, any major city today uh, uh, sends its ideas and its values out into the world. And so people embrace those, even if they're not actually in the city. But the city makes sin easily available. But how do we as Christians see the cities? Well, we see them as fallen. They're in ruin. They have no lasting value. We're not going to buy into their propaganda, and we're not going to participate in their destructive ways. That's not where we find our hope. A government holds an amazing promise, but we see its perpetual failure. <laughs> We're going to put our trust in God. And so world government that opposes the cause of Christ and false religion and philosophy are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Our commitment, we simply will not worship or serve them. Now, Christians who remain faithful continuing to live righteously, will be invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb, where all the eternal blessings are found. That's what we hope for. This is the, the reward for remaining a true in the work of Jesus Christ. And so this, is, this whole image is John's encouragement to those who felt the pressure of Rome. Hey, <clears throat> don't give in. <laughs> you remain faithful, and all the blessings of eternity are waiting on you. It will, it will be worth it. Now, there are lessons scattered throughout these chapters for the church, and it's important that uh, we learn those lessons. First of all, we are to have wisdom interpreting the world. I believe that John helps us do that. But when we look at our world and those parts of the world that seem perhaps invincible, perhaps scary, 
what we find is they have no lasting power. And they're either going to crumble in the historical process or they're going to crumble in the final judgment of God. Secondly, uh, Christ called us to come out, <laughs> come out of, uh, the, uh, of Babylon, come out of Rome, come out of the cities of the world, come out of the alluring world of temptation and sin. There's nothing new about this. It's always been there, and it's still here more than ever. And the call of Christ is for Christians to be different. We're not going to buy into its values. We're not going to buy into its pleasures. We're going to live life on a higher plane. Third, in 1812, uh, John, uh, or Jesus says through John, see and rejoice over the world's demise, over the final judgment of uh, all things human and uh, over mankind that is resistant to Christ. Now, we need to understand what's going on here. This really isn't uh, a statement that we should take great pleasure. The people are going to be judged and suffer. None of us do that. But we do rejoice over the fact that God will be vindicated. You know, God's righteousness and his holiness and his power and, and uh, uh, his importance as one to be worshiped is validated by his judgment against the world. And we should rejoice when God is finally seen by an unbelieving world for who he really is. <clears throat> Moreover, we should dress ourselves up in the righteous acts as we prepare for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Those invited to the feast are those who have been living righteously, and we should do the same. And then, of course, we need to worship God. We're not going to worship any form of government. We're not going to worship the ideas, controlling ideas that come out of the city. We are going to worship God. That's the great encouragement of uh, this section of Scripture. So, to sum it all up in these chapters, it's really pretty simple. <laughs> the victory belongs to us. That is, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So, we need to stand strong. We can't compromise our faith. And if we pay a temporary price for it here and now, uh, that simply can't compare to the eternal uh, blessings and rewards that we are going to get in Christ. What an amazing uh, section of Revelation that helps us see our world more clearly so that the things that seem so compelling and uh, so alluring <laughs> and so invincible Ah, uh, we see more clearly. You know, what has been said, uh, saying has been out there forever. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's exactly the message of Revelation that he wanted those first century Christians to hear and that we need to live by as well. Well, God bless you as uh, you go back and uh, read through this uh, section again. And as you prepare for the final uh, section of Revelation in chapters 20 through 22, uh, we've been brought up to the uh, judgment of God in all seven <clears throat> uh, sections of Revelation. But in the final section, it's going to reach its climax as we get a wonderful description of the reward that uh, God has waiting for us. Uh, until then, uh, may he bless you richly.